Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16 to 20. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma, and it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Anna Carter Florence, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers will include William Barber II, Lauren Winner, Robert Wright, Yolanda Pierce, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Register by February 15 to receive an early bird discount. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for Epiphany of Our Lord, which falls on January 6th and always falls on January 6th, 2022, are Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 6, Psalm 72, 1 through 7, and 10 through 14, Ephesians 3, through, uh, 3 1 through 12, and then Matthew 2, 1 through 12. We occasionally record an Epiphany of Our Lord podcast, not always. So this is the year we decided to offer that. Not everyone, of course, uh, celebrates, not every church and tradition celebrates Epiphany. But some do. Some traditions will move uh, a celebration of Epiphany maybe every other year or so to the following Sunday. So you have an opportunity to acknowledge and, and note this day in a, in a liturgical and sort of formal kind of circumstance. Uh, of course, if you are living in New Orleans, this is a very important day because it launches the carnival season. So uh, happy Epiphany, especially to our, uh, to our friends in, in the New Orleans area. Uh, Tommy, I'm talking about you and uh, some others. So enjoy, enjoy the beginning of carnival. But uh, Epiphany, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a great hymn. I mean, great carol. We Three Kings, one of my favorites. Love that one. But we've got this story of Matthew 2, of course, 1 through 12, and uh, unique to Matthew in this story of the threat of Jesus, of Jesus' birth to, uh, to the empire, to the uh, imperial realities, uh, the, the imperial strength of that time. And uh, of course, that is a, that's a major theme here that we have uh, in Matthew, but it recognizes that, again, talking about last week when we were, we were thinking about what difference does Christmas make, uh, what difference, how does, it, how, does it, how does it change things, and what, and what kind of impact does it have on our lives and on the world? And one of the, maybe one of the unassuming realities and, and maybe, a, maybe a revelation of God, of who God is and how God works, is that how is it possible that this child that is born uh, of, of Mary and Joseph in a manger in Bethlehem could actually upend the powers that be that could, could uh, challenge and threaten the uh, the these these rulers and these these powerful entities, and that's something to that's something to pause on, and I think has homiletical merit uh, to not only to what difference does Christmas make and what difference does Jesus' kingdom make for uh, for for us, but also the way in which it challenges the present ones. And, and, and challenges their kind of power. And it's also a way that God works in the world, that work, God works in those places of, uh, of, of unassumed power so as to thwart a uh, power that thinks it has power. And so I think there could be a lot, uh, a lot there as uh, possible directions for the meaning of epiphany. Yeah, it's such a great text. It's such a, a mysterious text. 
in the context of Matthew, which is a gospel that pretty much stays inside the borders of Israel. I mean that kind of conceptually and except for when it doesn't. And here's a place at the beginning where it breaks out just like in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, it will break out when Jesus talks about going into all the nations. So you've got these uh, peculiar characters in, 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 as, as biblical characters go who are of so many things, right? They're this, they're, they're wisdom from outside of the mainstream from the perspective of the text. They are Gentiles. Uh, they are um, powerful people with keen insight who nevertheless come to worship uh, the, the, a baby. Uh, and they're also these very politically savvy people just like Herod himself was uh, as, as, um, as violent and unpredictable as Herod was, he was also brilliant uh, politically speaking, knew how to survive throughout his career, knew about alliances, knew how to um, kind of always be a step or two ahead of his rivals, uh, except here, <laughs> which is, uh, it's a fascinating story. And of course you theolo theologize that so well, Caroline, talking about how this is not simply a story of, of narrow escapes, but this is about the dangerous realities of, of the transformation that the gospel promises. Mm -hmm. And this lovely reminder that some people don't want the world to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think too, one of, oh, one of the, I think one of the other uh, themes in this story, we're, we're so focused on, we're, we're so focused on Herod, of course, this, uh, you know, the evil king. And, and then of course the, the, the magi and, uh, and, and the, the sort of the, the the plot line of this and and uh, the meaning of what this is and and then of course on Jesus, but the ways in which we the ways in which we are reminded of God's activity of God's intervention here, that in verse twelve for example and having been warned warned in a dream, and the last time of course we heard about a dream I think in Matthew is the dream to Joseph, right and so. This we're reminded of God's intervention and that God is actually uh, active in this text, and 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 it, we were we're talking about the way in which God's presence in Jesus is going to upend the powers that be, but also the way in which God thwarts Herod's plans here uh, in a way that only God can do through a dream that then sends the Magi not back to Herod, but uh, to their own country by another road. And so it's, uh, it's, it, it's also a promise of that intervention too, uh, in, the midst of, in the midst of acting out what the, what the wise men, the Magi seem called to do, there's also this affirmation of God's intervention that that will be followed. And I think uh, that's another direction that maybe one could take. Absolutely. And I think, you know, Epiphany is, it gets treated as kind of a bridge season between the, the fun of Christmas to the, the beginning of Lent. And I know for a lot of people in ministry, they're either resting during parts of Epiphany or scattering around trying to get ready for, for, for Lent and the run up to Easter. But it's such an important, I think theologically, it's such an important season because it, it addresses uh, well, it addresses a, a key question, right? How is this Messiah going to become known to the world? so much of the birth narratives in Matthew and Luke speak about his obscurity, right? And not being around those in the halls of power. So now how is this going to work? How is this going to make a splash on the world stage? And so there's that, like, what does it take for the Messiah to become manifest? And we'll see some of that in the baptism coming up. And then some of these epiphany texts from the beginning of the gospels. But there's also this idea of how will this older promise get fulfilled? And this I really like all four texts this week. I'm not usually a combine the text person, but there's all of these in some way, shape or form speak to the, the promise and the problem of how is God going to bring the universal out of the particular? So how is the blessing uh, of, to, to Israel going to now become, right? Good news for all the nations. What's going to attract the nations to come to Zion and to come streaming in? Um, there's obviously no Abraham text assigned this week, but that's part of it. So how is how is good news to this this child born in Bethlehem going to now somehow uh, attract 
which is an interesting theological question to ask, right? Why does God choose to do it this way? Who knows? But what does that look like, right? What are we working toward you know, as we imagine the church here as a, a way of retelling the gospel story? I think the, I think first of all, um, last uh, in the podcast for last Sunday, you're were, you're were having the infinite uh, in the part in the finite, and now you've got the universal in particular. Uh, going now, we're doing Aristotle and Plato. Wow, Matt, Matt, you're kind of showing your range here. Um, but what are you going to do for next Sunday? That's the big one. I mean, got to keep it going for us. Um, we're going to have to stick around. I think I that. will. I will. So one of the things I've learned in the last few years is just how well the liturgical year uh, season of Epiphany does map across all four Gospels that in all four Gospels, you get the first movement is the manifestation, the Epiphany of, of, of the Christ in the world. Uh, and then either at transfiguration in the synoptics or, you know, at the end of the book of signs in uh, John, you get that turn towards Lent. So then, especially in Luke, you know, it becomes the journey to Jerusalem, which is the Lenten uh, focus. But so I really, Epiphany really makes sense to me. Um, I suspect that that makes me really, I guess the word I'm, I'm looking for a polite uh, way to say Bible nerd, you know, I mean that, you know, that is just to appreciate the first half of, of all four gospels in, in its own right for being the first half. But so the way that God's Messiah uh, is at first revealed is he shows up and starts calling disciples. And, and uh, I think that's, you know, he starts going around teaching, calling disciples. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the universal then in, uh, is only possibly manu manifest in the particular. Sorry. That's my Aristotelian background. Maybe that takes us to Isaiah then. Yeah, I love I, I I love this Isaiah text, and uh, I appreciate the way in which uh, Corey Driver and uh, pulls out of the text uh, a theme that that really is uh, important in the late Old Testament material, but one uh, that is not commonly appreciated, and that is the that you get this tiny little country, uh, especially the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, that is so beleaguered and constantly being oppressed and destroyed by the empires of its era. And they keep saying, no, no, all of you are going to come to us to learn how to walk in the light of the Lord. Yeah. You may have destroyed us and taken our walls and our temple and our King, but one day you're going to, you're going to learn to follow the Lord by coming to see us, which is just a crazy crazy um counterculture doesn't even begin to describe how sort of insane that must have sounded to the babylonians you know who just you know kicked uh 14 kinds of dog stuff out of judah and then then you've got judah going oh yeah well let me tell you and so you get this eschatological vision that uh of nations will come to see your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn and so on and Again, where does that begin to happen? Well, Jesus and the disciples, Jesus calls. Well, and I think it gives a really interesting perspective on Epiphany that we don't talk about as, as often. And that is, yes, we are talking about Epiphany, the manifestation, how God manifests God's glory, how Jesus manifests his glory, how Jesus is a manifestation uh, revelation appearance of, of God, presence of God, but that there's an effect on us as well, that what, it, what kind of, I mean, obviously we have a reaction to the light or to those revelations, to those appearances, but it, it, the way in which we take on that light, that, that epiphany happens to us in that, what, it, how, how is it that we are epiphanies? How is it that we are, I always like to use this word, Epiphanus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how is it that that we take on that very radiance? That's what I hear in this text this time. You know, your light has come 
uh, then you shall see and be radiant that there is a that there is that it, in it, in experiencing that that epiphanous moment that how is it that we then are 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 epiphanies as well of God's glory and God and God's presence and uh, maybe going a little bit back to you know John the Baptist and witness but it's a different way to think about we're not we're not just spectators and we don't just observe this and point it out that there is a uh, there's a kind of response here a kind of action here that that says uh, what what is that actually doing to us and how does it change how does the appearance of God in our midst actually change us uh, transform us I think it I, I think I would start off with seeing however you said it's more than just seeing but at least there's in this text at least there's two parts of it that's that speak that to me so verse four like lift up your eyes and look around and then verse five then you shall see and be radiant so it's part of it is about paying attention i think it's about noticing what god has done and is doing and and i would you know would suggest that part of that is is seeing at a different level right there's this kind of binocular vision going on and in the prophetic writings and later in apocalyptic writings that you're, you're seeing things that everybody else wouldn't see or you're interpreting events in ways that might defy ordinary explanations. But this, I don't know, you asked, how are we transformed? I would say maybe the first thing is to pay, we need to pay better attention um, <laughs> and look for that and, and, and to develop those habits of seeing, or maybe I'd say perceiving instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, and that's one way to think about moving through epiphany. What, what are those ways of seeing that we are called to take on uh, different kinds of ways of seeing and what will we right. see? Yeah. Result? Well, they're not ordinary, I would suppose, right? They're not just about statistics. They're not just about mm -hmm. following certain types or patterns. What glory will you see? What glory will you pay attention to? There you go. Somebody just found their epiphany preaching theme. Ah, there we go. <laughs> uh, Three more small details about this text. One is what famous book? Its title was inspired by this passage. What I ask this every book? three years. Yeah. You ask this every three years. That's why the only reason I know the answer. I know because you always know the answer. Well, it's all that it's all that philosophy I read. Read. And it's uh, Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. 1776. Wow. I've never read it. It's, I just know it because every three years you say no it's, one has read it. It's just uh, my Bob Garhart talked I, about I just, it all the time. And he I just know I don't like it. <laughs> Actually, I think you do. But it's a yes, a, a, an inquiry into the wealth of nations. And then second of all, uh, Matt, maybe you could explain what does it mean that a multitude of camels shall cover you? It sounds to me like I'm being stampeded. It's, it's always a little bit worrying to me that. It just sounds like it sounds like I left the gate open one night and I show up the next morning and I've got all these camels in my yard eating everything and I don't know how to get rid of them. Yeah, yeah, like the turkeys in our neighborhood, right? I know it's a sign of wealth, prosperity, probably, right? To have a, a, a herd that can, I don't know if camels travel in herds or not, a group of camels. Camels are warm. Uh, well, I'm so sure, you, I know it's good news, but it just strikes me as they the, come over the, the, the multitude you. of camels covering me sounds really Toasties. constraining. Yeah, that's because the you here throughout Isaiah 60 is feminine singular, meaning the city Jerusalem. So they just, just, and that's the big detail I was trying to drive at. So throughout this passage, arise, shine, for your light will come. You will see all those yous that, that we've been talking about. They're all feminine singular because they're all speaking of Jerusalem, which I think uh, it's inaccessible. Uh, poetically to uh to to native english speaker first of all and but at least at the very much at the very least this is a communal act none of this like you're just talking about seeing being radiant all that none of that is done individually it's all done by the community uh in this case as it is in uh inhabited uh in jerusalem but I think that we can easily make the move to our own communities uh, to notice that not, we don't do any of this work alone. It's impossible to do alone. Yeah. Didn't you have three details? That was it. Wealth, Wealth of, of nations, nations camels. camels. 
Oh, the yeah, city right. is feminine singular. Oh. I mean, the you here is feminine singular. I thought you were going to instruct us about camels in more detail, but that's fine if you don't. We can say it is because the, the 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 you who's being uh, covered by by a multitude of camels is the it's city Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It's right. as and because the camels is the long distance. It's the eighteen wheeler of the day. If they're going to bring a whole lot of gold to you, the only way they could do it in the ancient world in that part of the world was camels, right? So that's I wish why they had said it that way. Yeah. Well, instead of this idea of a camel infestations. I know. Disturbing. Camels can carry a lot. There you go. I think it's because I got spit on by a camel once. I'm kind of. <laughs> have you ever been on a camel? I should I move on. I have not because I know that once they put you on, you have to pay them to get off. Uh, I, I think I had to pay to get on too. Five dollars though. That that's not bad. Five dollars. Yeah, that's twenty for them. Camel. Then it's I was twenty to get off. I was hoping for a geography maven, maven or uh, in this case, maybe just a tourist maven moment. Yeah, at the base of the Mount of Temptation is camel rides, along with a just fascinating souvenir shop. You can get all kinds of really great stuff. But yeah, camel rides right there. So the king in Psalm 72 um, uh this is an idealized, it's a view of what the king was supposed to be like. Long story short, basically none of them were. Well, no, let me say this more strongly. None of them were. None of them did this. Um, they, they would have their moments of doing this, but uh, this is your, um, this is your, uh, our ideals versus their realities sort of uh, propaganda speech. But it does show, uh, it does contrast Jesus and the type of king he is much more, I mean, inhabiting these uh, virtues uh, as opposed to uh, what actual kings are like. Matt, you were saying earlier, some people don't want the world to change. Yeah, because it benefits them. And the people that want the world to change want it probably to benefit them. And uh one of the realities is that the gospel of Jesus doesn't replace one set of ideologies with another set of human ideologies, which is why no human ideology can replace or even be analogous to the gospel. If that made any sense, and I wasn't just living in too many abstractions like my systematic theologian friends. Well, in, in particular, the, the kind of king uh, in that, as you said, Rolf, that in verse 11 or verse 12, delivering the needy when they call the poor and those who have no helper, pity on the weak and the needy, saving the lives of the needy from oppression and violence, redeeming their life. Uh, that, 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 that's the activity of, of, of the, of a king who represents God. And, uh, and you put that in contrast to the realities that we know of the kings, the, the kingship, the kings are those in power uh, into which Jesus was born and uh, and the way that the way in which, of course, they exercise power is a very different kind of reality. Well, it's, it describes what we long for, and in, in that regard, it's it reminds me of the Magnificat. Obviously, it's a very different kind of piece of literature and different kind of context. But it's is this psalm attributed to anybody? I think it's a song of Solomon. Okay, I um, can check. Who also fast. didn't? Who also didn't really deliver? Um, He's got the one story. <laughs> it's one more than I've got. So yeah, it's the fact that it's in there. I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's the kind of Psalm that speaks toward, I think what most people hope for, maybe not the Herods of the world, but there's something about the image here. That's, that's beautiful. And of course, incredibly elusive, but. Yes, this is a song of Solomon. And then you get the note after it, the songs of Jesse. David, son of Jesse, are ended, which is very strange to have after a song of Solomon. But anyway, yeah, it's, um, I mean, to, to hold up the fact that, the, that Jesus didn't bring in a different set of theology. And, you know, you're talking about he changes the world. What was the language we were using? He th throws the world's power structures upside down. Except for he doesn't. I mean, that is the Roman emperors continue to rule, you know, 
And when they were done, some other emperor or king replaced them. Um, it's, it's only in the fact that you end up with a, uh, a community of disciples that are uh, committed to a gospel rather than a kingdom in some ways shows the radical departure from the world's power structures. Well, Ephesians is a, this is more again about how does, how does expansion happen, right? Or how does the realization happen? So for the author of Ephesians, it's a mystery or it was kept hidden, right? But now this it's, it's, it's Jew and Gentile together, right? We're jumping way far ahead in the story of the New mm -hmm. Testament here. And in, he's in, in jail. Ephesians. Paul's in jail or prison of some kind. Incar I'm going to say incarcerated. That's a better word. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's well, it's interesting that it talks about it as a mystery. Uh, I I do like the way in which um, uh, the Daniel Kirk, in talking about the passage in his commentary on our website, describes the the revelation as not just something that God reveals, or that God re or a mystery that God unfolds for people like the, you know, the holy apostles and prophets as, as, um, as the author of Ephesians calls them, but also to the church that revealing is done through the church as well, uh, which is, which is key that that becomes, you know, this is similar to what you were talking about earlier, Caroline, about how do we yeah. respond to this or live into this, but it's embodied and it's, it's, mm -hmm. um, right. Churches preach and all that they do. It's not just what happens for 15, 20 minutes from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. It's uh, a church's budget preaches a message to the world. A church's programming preaches a budget to the world. A church's ethos and hospitality or lack thereof preaches a message to the world. And so how to help people see the, 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 the good news is expressed in who we are together and how we conduct ourselves together and how, what kind of neighbor we want to be in a community together. And um, I think I think Ephesians takes us that direction if we want to to talk about how might you be changed by Epiphany. We talk a lot about how people might be changed by Advent or Christmas or by Lent or by Holy Week, but we don't often think of Epiphany as something that would can be transformative. But there's your route. What was your uh, what was your sermon theme again, Caroline? What glory oh. will you manifest or something? Yeah, well, yeah. So there you go. 